So uh, Yanis Hoca has a Juris uh, Doctor degree from the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. He then did a Master of International Affairs at the School of um, International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, New York, uh, in the United States. Uh, he opted for a PhD program um, in London, uh, working with Professor William Yale uh, in politics. Um, and uh, he, was, he did his studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, once again at the University of London. Uh, he joined BKent the year I joined. So, so we, we both joined back in 2009, uh, and we've been very happy to be working together here over the past number of years. Um, before coming to BKent, Yandis Soja held uh, very important positions at Sabancı University in Istanbul, Ushuk University again in Istanbul, and also at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens in Athens, Greece. Uh, since then, Yannis Hoca held many visiting professorship positions, uh, has a long list of uh, research stays, which include uh, the Northeastern U University's uh, Buffet, Buffett, Cent Buffett Institute uh, for Global Studies, where he held a visiting position in the modern Turkish studies program. He also held positions uh, at Glasgow University um, in, in the UK, as well as the American University in, uh, in Yerevan, Armenia. Yanis Olja, which I should also add, uh, perhaps I should have started with his, uh, his chair uh, position as the Jean Bonnet chair at Bilkent University. This is a very prestigious position, and Bilkent um, is, is very proud. My university is very proud, as well as my department has been very proud to uh, have Yandi Soja with us as a Jean Monnet professor in European studies, uh, which is funded by the commission, awarded by the European Commission, uh, which is the, the executive uh, arm of the European Union. Based on this work and, and before this work, he's been consulting the European Commission. So he has been a very important person uh, as a contact point for the, for the European Union, not only from the perspective of the EU's public institutions, but also um, as, as a member of the research community, scholarly community uh, of, of Europeanists in and around uh, Europe. So we're, we're very happy and very lucky to, uh, to have Yannis Soja with us. Uh, recently, Yannis Soja started editing a very important journal. Uh, the name of the journal is uh, Southeast European and Black Sea Studies. Again, um, our students and, uh, and members of our community uh, look forward to publishing stuff publishing their papers, their, their research outlets, uh, their research papers in this very influential, increasingly influential journal. Yannis Soja has also uh, been one of the leaders of the Palgrave Pivot book series, uh, which is focusing on politics of the Mediterranean. Again, uh, who better than, than uh, Yannis Soja to, to speak to us about uh, uh, Greece, Turkey, Mediterranean uh, area and politics. Uh, this I, 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 you will hear from me as, as, I, as I talk uh, several times. Uh, Yanis Soja has also been contributing to many dailies, uh, not only in, in Greece, but also uh, BBC's World Service. The two dailies I have been following have been uh, the names of which, the titles of which are uh, Tanea and Katimerini. Um, he, his, his work may also have been published in E. Katimerini II. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether that is true, Yanis, but, uh, but I, I'm sure uh, the electronic version has also been um, showcasing your, uh, your contributions. Uh, Yanis Uja has completed four books, and uh, one or two, actually two are in the pipeline, 
I'm very happy to share with you. Uh, the latest book is on is titled Democratic Transition and the Rise of Populist Majoritarianism, um, and where he looks at constitutional reform in Greece and Turkey in comparative perspective. Again, this also um, really uh, talks to uh, the issues we shall be talking about um, today. Uh, I've known Yannis Hoca's work when, I, when we first joined the Political Science and Public Administration Department here at Vikent uh, through his, uh, his first major book uh, titled Trials of Europeanization, excuse me, where he was focusing on Turkish political culture and um, he was making an historical institutionalist argument of comparing uh, what's happening in Turkey over the past century or so. Uh, both of these books uh, were published by um, the reputable publisher, uh, Palgrave. Uh, I, can't, I can't really list the publications of Yannis Hoca here. This is countless. Uh, uh, Yannis Hoca is a prolific writer. He is a contributor to as I said, many, many uh, journal articles, as well as book chapters, uh, many book reviews, in numerous reports and press articles. Um, so if you search, if you look at, if you skim through Yannis Switch's uh, pages and pages of CV, you'll see how, how in different directions he contributes to not only the scholarly community, uh, but also the world of policy practice, as well as informing, uh, informing the general public. This we feel increasingly uh, to be one of our uh, as scholars of um, uh, public policy, political science, social science, public administration. We tend to think that we need to inform, better inform, uh, not only policy practice, uh, not only. Um, having conversations with our scholarly community, but also um, inform the general public about uh, society, culture, politics, religion, economy, political economy, and what have you. Let me turn to uh, Yanis Hoca's um, research, uh, which really um, is about today's, um, today's agenda. Uh, Yanis Hoca's research sheds light on some of the central issues that are prevalent, um, not only in Turkey, but also in Greece. And I would say, I'm not sure whether he generalizes his work, his findings on Greece and Turkey to other South European uh, Mediterranean um, states, but also I, I find his research to be talking not only to Greece, and Turkey, but, but also to Italy, to Spain, uh, to Portugal too. Um, I find his comparative approach to be very well, uh, um, very well informed by, by theory and, and uh, very firmly grounded in, in, in empirical facts, empirical data. His work on populism left and right populism, so left-wing populism as well as right-wing populism, as well as his emphasis on majoritarianism in the process of democratic consolidation in these especially two cases, uh, suggests macrocausal links. And all these links, I feel, as I follow Yanis's work, uh, yield, uh, yields comparative insights about these two uh, countries, day-to-day -day politics, as well as um, how the economy is run, um, how political culture um, emerges and is changing. Dr. Gregoriadis' work uh, relies on the experience of the Greek case, as well as on the Turkish case, um, to underline that the cost of populist majoritarianism not only in Turkey and Greece, um, is um, weaker institutional performance, but also aggravating social divisions. Uh, Yanis Hoca's work examines in this context both the economic, uh, I'm sorry, the cultural side of 
these divisions, as well as the political economy sides uh, side of uh, all these divisions, uh, is really considering the effects of, and I'm really referring to his work on religion as well as populism here. Um, the way he has been looking at civil military relations in Greece and Turkey, uh, which I mean, on this very anniversary, needless to say, marks uh, or talks about important turns, important milestones, uh, not only in Greece, but also in Turkey. Here is my next question. Uh, why should we care about comparing Turkey, Turkey and Greece? Um, if one skips through the news um, of these two countries, if you look at the dailies uh, here in Turkey as well as in, in, in Greece, we would see striking contrasts as well as similarities, of course, that, that uh, these two nations have been, you know, head to head, uh, clashing against one another, uh, sometimes depicting as, as opposing in, in opposition to one another. On, you know, many matters, uh, such as geopolitics and diplomacy. Uh, yet, when you scra once, once you scratch the surface, uh, of, of what's going on here and right across the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, what we call them, uh, what we call it, we see uh, a reality which is very much different. We see a shared vocabulary uh, between the two sides of the Aegean. Um, and, and this has been part of a very lively conversation uh, and, and beyond etymological uh, concerns or etymological chatter. Uh, so where does the term, where does the word baklava comes from or yogurt comes from or simit comes from? Um, and, and I'm sure you, you, you've all been witness to uh, this conversation. Uh, what is more important here is the noticeable, I would say remarkable, strikingly remarkable similarities between Greece on the one hand and Turkey on the other. Uh, which in my research I also emphasize as uh, to be part of the administrative tradition of uh, Napoleonic origin. Uh, we both share, partly in part because of the Ottoman rule in, in Greece, but partly because uh, Greece has been uh, part of the Mediterranean basin, an administrative tradition an administrative culture which has been shaped by early 19th century French ways of administration, uh, which many scholars, is, is including myself, call the Napoleonic state tradition, the Napoleonic administrative tradition, in this very centralized and state-dominated approach to public policy. Uh, we've seen in Greece, as well as in Turkey, the state to be um, the t uh, to be the, the game changer, uh, in fact, a game maker, uh, to be the foremost, if not the sole important decision maker regarding matters in uh, power, politics, and redistribution of power in politics. So if indeed they are, in, they are similar in terms of their democratic traditions and policy styles, what better way could there be to understand the historical legacy the historical trajectory of our democracy in Turkey than to compare it with our neighbor next door. Um, I certainly believe Dr. Yanis Grigoriadis' uh, research and his, his talk today will yield many insights, especially at a time when we need, need to think about democracy, uh, more so perhaps than, than, than other concepts, uh, not only in Europe, not only in my country, not only in where Yanis comes from, uh, not only in Southern Europe, if you follow the election news, but all over the world. Um, I'm delighted, once again, uh, let, me, let me confirm, let me restate how delighted I am uh, to have, to be hosting Yanis Hoja with us. Um, and I am leaving the floor to you. But before I do that, um, let me announce to you that we be, would be very happy to, to receive some questions depending on our time. Um, 
And uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat box. Uh, Yanis Hoja will be, uh, will try to, depending on our time, will try to responding uh, to, to them by the end of our session. Thank you for joining us. And I leave the, the floor to Yanis Hoja. Yanis, Jim, the floor is yours. Uh, Yanis, can you follow us? Maybe sometimes, you know, uh, Zoom has, has these. Okay, he'll, he'll probably come back to us in, in the next minute. Uh, sometimes these things happen. But, uh, but I, I, I mean, let, let, me, let me rephrase something. Um, when I was thinking about, you know, what to do for this occasion, uh, comparing, I'm a comparativist by training, and, and I, I urge not only my, my fellow students, but also my, my fellow faculty to look at uh, things not only from a historical perspective, but also compare, I mean, in comparison to, to one another. Uh, Yanis, I should stop here uh, and leave the floor to you. So good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Tolga Hojan, for this very generous introduction. I hope I rise up to the expectations that you've created with your <laughs> words. I would like also to thank Ardath Hoja for his invitation uh, to make this uh, talk on this very important uh, anniversary. I think it's important to remember the victory of democracy against uh, oligarchic uh, views uh, of the state. I would like to contribute to a better discussion on democratization through a comparative approach of the recent, uh, of the last century of democratization in Greece and Turkey. As Tolga mentioned, uh, Greece and Turkey are normally remembered in antithetical terms in polar opposites that don't consider to be as a sort of a normal comparison pair. Like you don't want to compare these countries because you think that they are very different on many levels. But I would argue the opposite, that there are a lot of interesting areas where comparative study of Greek and Turkish politics can be very fruitful. I have authored two books on aspects of this. Uh, for example, uh, I've explored the role of religion in Greek and Turkish nation building in one of my books. And I highlighted some interesting patterns, some interesting trends to be explored in both countries. This. Uh, the beginning of a very secularist definition of national identity where religion appears to be as a threat and as a factor to be contained and controlled, which eventually turns into a more synthetic approach of identity where uh, the nation and religion are compromised and there is a synthesis of the two. And I also explored in the book that Olka Hoja mentioned uh, the rise of populist majoritarianism, how in the process of democratization in Greece and Turkey, uh, we had a moment whereby the populist majoritarian definition or version of democracy became dominant. Those who study comparative politics know that uh, we normally talk in the literature about majoritarian versus consensus democracies, which are both democratic, but they are bound by different principles. So the results may be very different in the end. And the political regime that we live in may look very, very dissimilar from each other. So I try to highlight that uh, in the process of democratic consolidation in Greece and Turkey, majoritarianism played a big role, which was explained because of certain historical uh, legacies in both countries. But on the other hand, majoritarians put some limits to the quality of democratic consolidation. Why? Because it promotes social divisions, introduces the quality of institutions. So if we talk about state capacity, or we talk about national consolidation and solidarity, majoritarianism is not delivering optimal results. Today, I will focus my presentation on another aspect, uh, which is similar, relevant to the discussion we had today and to the anniversary, that is the role of the military in Greek and Turkish politics. I think it's important to put it on the regional dimension as well, as Tolga Hoja mentioned, because Greece and Turkey were not, they were not, they were not the two only countries in the South Mediterranean that experienced military rule. 
Spain and Portugal experienced decades of military rule, even in the aftermath of the Second World War, because it's important, and I'm making this in my presentation, which I will launch now. It's important to remember that for many years, until the beginning of the 50s, democracy, liberal democracy, was rather a minority choice in European politics. Uh, Non-democratic solutions were prominent in many European countries, and it's only after the end of the Second World War and the division of the uh, of world into the Western and the Eastern camp that uh, multi-party politics and democratization appeared to be something of a priority for the members of the Western camp. Nevertheless, Spain and Portugal survived for all these years. I will look, however, in my presentation how the military played an important role in Greek and Turkish politics already in the 19th century. What I refer to that, we can see how the military uh, sort of uh, appears as the guardian of the state and the people. And in that respect, we can refer, of course, to the famous Republic of Plato, whereby Plato engages with the idea of the guardians. Plato famously identifies three social classes, the guardians, the auxiliaries, and the producers. And he highlights that the role of the guardians is to provide sort of security and sort of uh, make sure that the rest of the society works well. But of course, then the fundamental question comes up, which is who will guard us from the guardians themselves? Which of course raises a question of every democracy has checks and balances. How a, a functional check and balance system can make sure that no excesses or no sort of violation of the constitutional principles are observed. In the modern era, we can highlight how the military has played a key role of uh, modernization uh, a catalyst in countries like Greece and Turkey. And I would highlight that this is a key important feature of Greek and Turkish politics already in the 19th and 20th century. Many important political developments, and I can start here referring to the case of Greece. Greece emerges as an absolute kingdom, an absolutist kingdom in 19, 1830. But in 1844, Greece acquired its first constitution, becomes the constitutional monarchy through a military coup, which forces a constitution on the king. And later, in several phases of Greek democracy, we can highlight how military interventions were meant to bring Greece closer to the institutional paradigm that uh, uh, were prominent in Western Europe at the time. I think it's important to highlight that uh, the concept of conscript army is very important in that respect. And I think that's another interesting common feature between Greece and Turkey, right? I don't know of many other European countries whereby there is a mandatory military service yet. The reason for this, I think, is that both Greece and Turkey come from this very sort of Republican French tradition, whereby the army is the true defender of the people. Why this was the case? Because of course, in the French Revolution, the army, which was part of the established elite, took the side of the king. So the revolutionaries get to establish their own national army. So in this French Republican tradition, the army becomes uh, the representative of people's interests and as well as an instrument for nation building. So national values are meant to be communicated through uh, the army to the conscripts. This is a concept that has remained quite strong in Greek and Turkish politics throughout the 19th and 20th century. Why did I chose uh, the word century as a point of reference in my presentation? The reason is because of course, we have the anniversary of the Treaty of Lausanne in a few days, 24th of July, 1923. And we had a few weeks ago, the anniversary of the Greek-Turkish population exchange. And of course, last year we had the end of the Greek-Turkish war, which all these are events profoundly shaping both countries. They define Greek and Turkish identity. They define institutions in, Greek and, in Greece and Turkey. And also, of course, define the role of the army to some degree. In that respect, uh, this war uh, shapes Greece in a very, very profound way. 
gives the opportunity of the Greek army to intervene into politics. It is something not widely known, but there are much more coups that happen in Greece in the 20th century than those happening in Turkey, if you look into the numbers. Of course, the Greek coups are more concentrated in the first half of the 20th century, not in the second half. In the second half, there's only one and long-lasting coup. But it is important to understand that the, the military didn't remain neutral to politics. The military wanted to take part into politics and shape politics because they thought that they know better than the people about how things should go. Of course, in the case of Greece, there is a sort of a long-standing uh, social division, which is reflected with uh, supporters of Venizelos, the prime minister of Greece of the first uh, three decades, and the king or the royal establishment, which eventually uh, morphs into a debate about whether Greece should be a kingdom or should become a republic. These debates are debates where the army plays a big important role, and eventually the army will take a clear right-wing conservative position on the side of the, of the king, and it will establish the second long-lasting military regime in Greece. Uh, the Kunda of Ioannis Metaxas in 1936 to 1940, which establishes a firm authoritarian regime in Greece in light with the fascist regimes in Europe at the same time, which, however, considers Greece's geopolitical interest and refuses to join Germany and Italy in the, seven, in the Second World War. So Greeks will join the war when attacked by Italy on the side of the Allies. And of course, that's a very important difference in the case of Turkey, whereby Turkey, based on the very bitter experience of the First World War, decides to remain neutral throughout the 1920s, 30s, and uh, throughout, in, even in the, until the very last phase of the Second World War. And of course, there we have a program of top-down modernization, whereby the leadership has, of course, given up its military sort of uh, uh, Epaulets, like the, there are no more military figures, the leaders of the Turkish Republic, but of course they have a military origin, very important figures that run the country's political affairs in the 1920s and 30s. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about uh, Mustafa Kemal, but other as well have military background. So, of course, here the project is a very promising and a very daunting one. Turkey should join the Western civilizational paradigm. And the Republican transition is a step of this, but this Republican transition is not followed by steps towards democratic consolidation. So Turkey doesn't become a liberal democracy in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it is only in the aftermath of the Second World War that uh, a new political era will emerge and we'll have a multi-party political system. In the case of Greece, the situation is different. Why? Because the country is occupied by the Germans, Italians, and the Bulgarians. And the social division that has already been present since uh, the 1910s and 20s develops into civil war with the left wing forces fighting the pro Western forces in the country. And this, of course, uh, consolidates Greece's presence in the Western camp because the Truman Doctrine, the decision of the United States to intervene in uh, conflicts around the world as a superpower when they think that Western security interests are threatened, start through Greece and through Turkey. Eventually, Greece will join NATO, and uh, it will introduce a democratic constitution in 1952. However, there will be a lot of footnotes on the Greek democratic constitution. What I see here, that there would be some laws that uh, would have extra constitutional force and would limit human rights, and especially the, hum the rights of the, of the left political movement. The left was seen as an enemy within for decades in Greece, and this considered, uh, we have the rise of uh, establishment of a right-wing political affiliation. The king plays a key important role together with the military, and this leads into splits into the right-wing establishment of the country that eventually leads to the 1967 coup. So the 1967 coup is a turning point in Greece because Greece, despite its experience with democracy and its problematic sort of uh, 
relationship with the rule of law or with uh, full protection of human rights uh, was, a fu- was this functioning democracy in 1967. And this ends, of course, there. In the case uh, of Turkey, uh, we have, as I mentioned before, the transition to multi-party politics. We have the 1950 election, this transition to the Menderes era. And the 1960 coup, which is the first direct intervention of the Turkish army into the course of Turkish democratic politics. Here, I would like to highlight a key difference between the nature of Greek and Turkish coups, especially in the post-war era. Turkish coups are short term. The army avoids to take full responsibility for the government of the country because it doesn't want to become politicized. It recognizes the threat of becoming involved into day-to-day politics and losing this elite status that it wanted to nurture. Of course, uh, its interventions are very crucial and very, very strong, but they don't want to stay longer than necessary. In the case of the Greek coup of 1967, 1974, we have a different model because the government, the army decides to take over government indefinitely. There is no interest or no promise of giving power to responsible political leaders or sort of trying to shape politics through a new constitution as the case of the Turkish military coups was. The army wants to take on full responsibility for the country. And this, of course, leads to a very, very sort of um, paradoxical situation whereby the army uh, loses its legitimacy and its credibility. And here I would like to raise, of course, the Cyprus question. I think that the Cyprus problem is crucial for state military relations, both in Greece and in Turkey. Why? Because in a way, Turkey's victory in Cyprus in 1974 consolidates the position of the military in Turkish politics because of the military victory. While on the other hand, the failure of the Greek junta to protect Greek security interests in Cyprus in 1974, delegitimizes it in front of the Greek public opinion and becomes a crucial trigger for democratic consolidation. And here, of course, I refer to democratic consolidation as a multi-phase process. Of course, the end of military rule over politics is important, but it's not the only step towards achieving democratic consolidation. But it is important to remember that because of the events in 1974, there is government and regime change in Greece. Konstantinos Karamalis, who was kicked out of government in the 1960s by the leaders uh, that of the, by the king and his establishment that eventually collaborated with the junta, comes back and he is determined for two things, to turn Greece into a republic, and he runs a referendum for this and he gets the result that he desired first, and the second, of course, is to, to push Greece into EEC membership. Karamalis recognized that uh, Greece's EEC membership is both an economic security and political priority. Why? Because he realized that to consolidate Greek democracy, Greece needed to become part of the greater European family. And this discussion is also happening a few years later in Spain and Portugal. And the European authorities, the European Commission, appears willing to turn a blind eye to Greece's economic shortcomings. So there are some interesting discussions. When the Commission submits a recommendation for Greece's EEC membership in the 1970s, we see that Greece is not really fully ready. But the political argument wins that you know we need to support pro-Europe, pro-democracy forces in Southern Europe, and Greece should be supported in that respect. Unfortunately, in the case of Turkey, the track of events is not similar. So while Turkey has negotiations with the EEC already uh, since the 1950s and 1960s, eventually uh, the course of Turkey's EEC membership in the 1970s is lost uh, also because of domestic political developments in Turkey. As in Greece, there is a left-wing criticism of the European Union economic community as a sort of capitalist or imperialist project. This was expressed by PASOK 
and Andreas Papandreou in the 90s and 70s, but this never kind of took the upper hand. And Papandreou, when he came to power in 1981, he didn't realize anything of his promises. Unfortunately, in the case of Turkey, there was a freezing of the negotiation process in the 70s when the threshold for membership was quite lower compared to today. And of course, then there is this uh, dreadful military coup of 1980, which turns Turkey into a completely different dimension. So in a sense, while Greece and Spain and Portugal are consolidating their democratic regimes, Turkey's democracy gets a very big blow. And this puts Turkey in a completely track, different track as far as democratization is concerned. We will have to wait more years, decades, for democratization forces to take, uh, again, the upper hand. Of course, this is linked on the one hand with Turkish economic and social transformation in the 1980s, the rise of new economic and social forces, globalization, the end of the Cold War, emerge as per permissive conditions for democratization. There is a new way of democratization in the 1990s. As Tolga Hoxha implied, now we may be witnessing a back sort of sliding of democracy across the globe on many levels. But back in the 1990s, there was a quite high degree of optimism in Eastern Europe, in East Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there was a lot of hope about democracy. And of course, Turkey's EU membership perspective became a litmus test. And it became clear back then in Turkey as well that Turkey's westernization can never be completed without democratic consolidation. So being Western in the 1930s or 40s required less. Now being Western also required a consolidated democracy. And this becomes a very important item in Turkish political agenda. And of course, this becomes clearer with the years of political reform. And this starts. Uh, there may be a problem with the with the link. Nine, when again a break happens. So in that respect, the EU reform starts, and when the AK Party government comes to power, it continues and advances this cause. And in that respect, of course, the AK Party administration takes the opportunity to take decisive control over the military, as in any democracy, whereby the government, the responsible government, the government elected by the people, should be making decisions about security and political affairs of the country. This, of course, became possible thanks to strong popular support. Uh, Turkey's people embraced democracy, and that's so wonderful. Of course, the role of charismatic leadership was also very important, as, of course, as well Western support. So Western, the West realized that uh, the role of the military, can, while in the 1950s and 60s, there was an assumption that the army keeps Turkey firmly in the Western camp, this was no longer the case in the 2000s. The Western government, the European Union, realized that full democratic consolidation requires full control of the government of the military. So in that respect, the coup attempt of 15 July is a, it's a criminal anachronism in my view that uh, had no appeal to the Turkish people and showed with the results that the democratic principle has struck strong roots in this country. So in order to conclude my short presentation and allow time for discussion and questions, I would like to make a couple of important points. Uh, first, that the army can no longer claim a tutelary position in Greece and Turkey. And I find this to be very important and positive. Democracy is embraced and owned by the people of Greece and Turkey in the last century. But on the other hand, the end of military role in politics, the end of military tutelage over politics is a necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy. We have to meet other benchmarks and meet other targets in order to argue that the country is a democratic country and democratic consolidation can take place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Sojam. This was uh, this was an eye opener uh, in in many respects. Uh, also for myself, who happens to have been working on uh, Greek politics, Greek um, political economy, Greek welfare state, and all that. It like you, this this really put a lot of um, insights into into comparative perspective. 
for my own research. This was enlightening. Thank you so very much. Uh, um, Mesdames et Messieurs, do we have any questions or comments? We can take uh, a few questions or comments before we, we finish this session. Uh, please feel free to write them on the chat box or I can, I can read them or, um, or, uh, or just raise your hand and I'll, um, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to take some questions. Uh, please, Charles or John. Uh, well, thank you very much. This is a fascinating talk. Um, lots of, uh, interesting points. I have, um, one of my questions is about, um, uh, you said, you know, the 2016 uh, attempted coup in Turkey did not have the support of uh, uh, people, so that was one of its great uh, failures. But I wonder, in Greece in 1967, when mm -hmm. the, uh, the military took over there, did they have the support of the people at that time? And the situation was complex because there were already some divisions within the establishment. So the, the, arm, the king had established his own government and had removed the centrist government that was enjoyed the parliamentary majority through a sort of a political machination within the parliament. So in that respect, uh, there was no significant popular response against this. Many were surprised about how easy the takeover of the military was in 1967. What's the most interesting thing that appeared in recent uh, sort of historical accounts is the position of the king, King Constantine, who died last year, and he was he could have become a hero of Greek democracy and consolidated the position of his dynasty had he defended the constitution. So apparently he could have stopped, he was the person to stop the putsches, the colonels, but he appeared to be unwilling to do this at the right moment. And he decided to launch a counter coup when it was too late for him. So he was exiled and eventually the putsches decided to declare a republic putting Papadopoulos, the leader of the sort of the coup in charge. So in that respect, many argue that although in the post-1974 Greece, opposition to the junta has become a defining element of Greek identity, that's why we have this Polytechnio anniversary, 17th of November, when the youth protested against the military regime, so this, in a sense, tries to whitewash to some degree the fact that most of the Greek people didn't appear to be willing to take active role in defending their democracy, but they tried to hide behind their students who did this some years later. So uh, I would say that the people didn't uh, take stand up to the circumstances in 1967. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, there's a question from the audience. Um, the, the, uh, this person would like to thank you, uh, Yanis, mm -hmm. for, for your talk. And he says he'd like to know if the Greek lobby or um, the Hellens abroad mm -hmm. have had any influence on the democratization process in Greece or of Greece. So, so, so the diaspora. Certainly so, Greece. especially during the 1967-1974 period. There were a lot of diaspora organizations, mm -hmm. both in Western Europe and in the United States, that tried to support the protection of human rights and the rule of law in Greece and the return of Greece to democracy. Don't let me highlight here that Greece was, a, I think, the first country that was expelled from the Council of Europe on the basis of its dismal human rights record in the 19, in the late 1960s. So, and that was possible thanks to the mobilization of many Greeks who were, of course, uh, sort of uh, concerned about the state of human rights in their country. On the other hand, let me highlight that there was a Greek-American vice president in the late 1960s, Piro Agnew, who sided with the colonels. So the picture was, I would say, like in civil society, by and large, yes, in favor of democratization, 
but they were key political figures of the Greek diaspora that decided to do business with the Kremlin. So, 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 so it's it's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, so, for, from one one angle, uh, yes. From another angle, uh, a member who has been uh, siding with uh, with the military, so against. But maybe uh, it's a personal uh, choice. I'm not. Government. I'm not saying that here presents a general trend, but I think it's worth mentioning that. Uh, and I think this was uh, the only Greek American who rose to the position of the vice president, mm -hmm. Spiro Agnew, who had to resign on corruption mm -hmm. allegations eventually. But he appeared to be a good partner with the military regime because, of course. Uh, the military regime, like in Turkey, came out with a very pro-Western, anti-communist sort of security-oriented agenda that was very accepted by certain uh, Washington circles at the time. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, very striking point. I, I'm, I, I should read more about this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions um, here? Uh, Yanis, before, before we close, can I ask you to think, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question question of comparison across time, across space, but across time, time-wise, I mean, historically, um, did the military change or like in, in, two, in two countries or um, did the militaries in two countries remain the same? But the context has changed. I know it's a difficult question, uh, I think it's, it's an interactive. Another... I think it's an interactive process. Both the process and the context changes, and the military's values, the military social structure, mm. has been profoundly changed. That's why I mentioned, for example, the existence of this conscript army as an important feature that brings the army closer to the people in a very sort of interesting way. So, but on the other hand, of course, you can see that the social background of key military figures in Greece and Turkey have changed over the decades. So we no longer see upper middle class or upper class youth willing to follow a military career, as might have been the case in the 19th or early 20th century. It's becoming more of a middle class sort of profession, right? Of course, social mobility there plays a very important role. And mm -hmm. of course, it's also important to consider the external role. So NATO, there are interesting like a famed works of socialization for the military elites in both Greece and Turkey. That, that's, so, that's so important to remember, NATO's role here in, in transforming the, the esprit de corps in the, in the military. Here's another question. Um, you mentioned that Karamanlis pushed for EU membership after, after 1974 to consolidate democracy, whereas Turkey... Uh, the the accession process well wasn't called it wasn't the accession process but the, but the Europeanization process uh, f was frozen. Why did Turkey uh, stop this process? Uh, this person is asking. Was the Turkish military involved uh, in the 1980s? I think this must be the 1980s. In retrospect, freezing the process seems to have been a bad decision for Turkey. Uh, um, so any comments here yet? Yeah, with the benefit of hindsight, it appears to be a very, very unwise decision on the side of Turkey because the threshold for membership was much lower in the 1970s. Turkey was a different country demographically, socially, and the European Union was a completely different organization. So uh, many of the benchmarks that we discussed, they didn't exist okay. back then. I think that the main reason for this uh, kind of failure was the government of Egypt and Erbakan that kind of agreed on an anti-Western narrative from an Islamist and the leftist perspective. And in addition to that, let me highlight what I straight uh, put straight before in regarding Greece, that Greece also saw the European Economic Community membership as a security requirement, priority to Turkey felt victorious. It had won a war in Cyprus. So it didn't feel that its security needed to be upgraded through a process of membership of the European Economic Community. Until then, and after this moment, 
Turkey and Greece would follow each other's inter international organization applications. So they normally apply together in order to get equal treatment. So no country joins an organization and gets an advantage over the other. But I think there, there was an interesting um, exception with profound consequences, of course, as we know. Uh, very profound consequences indeed. Uh, not only for uh, for Greece, but also Turkey. Um, okay, one last question. Um, uh, the Doctor Murat the Allah Ken. Uh, okay. Uh, can you, Can you hear me? Yeah, please, please, please. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Doctor Murat Allah from Galawa University. Uh, of the Department of International Relations. Thanks a lot for my old department, uh, Political Science and Public Administration, Bilkent University. I graduated from this department. Uh, first of Lovely all, thanks, to uh, uh, Lovely to have uh, you. thanks uh, a lot for the, the Dr. Iannis for this uh, presentation, who tries to analyze uh, from a comparative politics perspective uh, the Turkish and uh, Greek. Uh, historical evolutions of the democratic process, uh, uh, process uh, who uh, focused much on the uh, historical and political uh, transition period of the two countries. Uh, of course, I like much uh, comparative politics uh, courses, uh, thanks to the, uh, my professor, Umar Farouk Genskaya, and uh, also I have taken uh, comparative Turkish politics uh, from the professor Ergin Özgüden uh, twice. Uh, this issue is uh, very difficult. Uh, now uh, let's come to my uh, question. Uh, here, uh, how do you analyze uh, the uh, Turkish uh, democracy, especially uh, after the Second World War, the Soviet factor uh, as an international factor, uh, easy Turkey's uh, democratization process? Uh, both domestic and international factors positively uh, influenced. And Turkey also joined it into the Western uh, Security Pact. Uh, my question was uh, first. Uh, second question, uh, what about the uh, systemic factors, uh, such as uh, you have given examples of the EU factors uh, after the Turkish uh, interventions into the Cyprus and uh, Greece, favorite more uh, consolidating its own democracy. Uh, but uh, currently, uh, approximately 40 years, uh, Greece is a member of the European Union, uh, but there was an economic crisis. Uh, my second question, uh, third, sorry, third question, uh, about uh, Turkey and Greece political system. Uh, Greece has a multi-party democracy. Turkey uh, transformed its political system into the uh, presidential system. Uh, but, you know, in democracy, uh, majority decision is significant. Uh, but uh, in the multi-party democracy, any party wins 30% or 35% forms the government uh, after the election. But uh, majorities of the society uh, is being excluded uh, from being part of the state and government. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, do you believe a uh, multi-party democracy or presidential system uh, is uh, beneficial uh, for two countries, favoring their uh, democracy, uh, economic uh, growth, uh, and political stability. You know, to further and consolidate democracy, you need also economic, social uh, dynamics from the domestic factors, but uh, regional factors, uh, neighboring factors, and democratic experiences and past also is very significant. Uh, I am sure that uh, you all have understood uh, about the Turkey's presidential system here, uh, how they say that half of the societies uh, are being excluded from the systems. For instance, in uh, American democracy, the electorate, uh, the voters, they are ticketing their votes uh, for the senators, uh, Democrats or Republicans here, uh, so in the uh, executive body, how do you say that? Uh, you can find uh, all uh, uh, oppositions and governmental aspects uh, in governing the state. Uh, so uh, I hope that you have understood. Is there any systemic problems about Turkey's uh, political system? Because government favors presidential system. There is no any example of uh, Turkish presidential system in the world. 
and also opposition favors a parliamentarian system. Uh, but uh, how do you say that? Uh, here, uh, uh, there is a problem about the governance uh, of the two countries, uh, because in both countries there are uh, economic crises, also somehow a political crisis. Thanks a lot uh, Thank for you, being Ajay. patient uh, to listen to my question. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you very much for your questions. I'll try to answer all of them, starting from the last. Of course, whether Turkey has a presidential or parliamentary system, it's up for the people to decide and the elections make decision on that. If you ask my personal opinion, I do think that parliamentary system is a better fit for Turkey's uh, specific needs. And I do think that we need to remember that political systems are judged on two benchmarks. First, whether they can represent all different views and voices within a society, because you want all voices to be represented inside the system so that the system becomes stronger. And they, they don't challenge the system from the outside. And the second, of course, is that uh, what is important is to see institutional performance. So how can political regimes, political systems solve problems? Like how can they manage the economy? How can they manage the security policy? How can they manage the foreign policy? Sorry, I am interrupting your answering. Uh, let's make a, a quite analogy. Uh, giving example of the French uh, Napoleon unitary nation state system. But mm -hmm. France, by the Fifth Republic, uh, under the Charles de Gaulle, who was not semi president, who was a spare president. But thanks to the Francois Mitterrand, who worked together by the Jacques Chirac, left mm -hmm. his president, right as uh, prime minister. Uh, so, two terms later, uh, right as president, left as uh, prime minister here. Uh, so, uh, how do you say that the system of the democracy, I believe, not by the Charles de Gaulle, by the François Mitterrand, by the Jacques Chirac, which had been uh, French democracy consolidated. Also, both Greece and Turkey much influenced uh, from the France because both countries had a multicultural, multi-civil society. There are many different complex civil uh, societies. Uh, so, uh, the classical uh, parliamentary regime or classical presidential system, unfortunately, cannot uh, represent all political actors in the government. Uh, mm -hmm. To consolidate a democracy, we are talking about uh, liberalizations of the republics, uh, democratizations of the republics, but we cannot talk about consolidations of the two countries' democracy because mm -hmm. they cannot further, uh, Turkey is the the gate of the Asia, uh, Greece is the gate of the Europe, but in two countries like Berlin Wall, uh, they have structural uh, problems. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah, we need we need to be, be closing very soon. Yannis, if you could answer, John, please. Uh, yes. Please, so I, could, I, I think the remaining so questions, so uh, there was a question on the role of uh, the Soviet Union. Definitely uh, Turkey's transition to democracy a, like multi-party democracy in 1950 and the peaceful transfer of power, right? Which is the most important indication about a multi-party system that took place in 1950. It's very important. It's a like turning point in Turkish history. And I think there is a combination of both external and domestic factors. I, real, I think that both key political figures in Turkey realize that Turkey needs to make this leap forward and trust its people. <laughs> On this, and on the other hand, of course, Turkey wanted to join NATO, the security, the com security community of Western democratic states, mm -hmm. as was projected, also required uh, some uh, tangible steps in that respect. And Turkey joined NATO only two years later. Uh, regarding the economic crisis in Greece, it is an example of how the Greek political system failed to deliver solutions for decades. So how this the uh, as political system developed an equilibrium point which was not sustainable. Greece's membership of the Eurozone gave enormous opportunities to the country, but unfortunately, these opportunities were wasted. And then Greece ended up accumulating loan, or, which appeared to be something very tempting for the political elites, but this appeared to be unsustainable when the global crisis came and everybody come, came to their senses and realized that Greece cannot borrow at the same interest rate with Germany or Netherlands. And of course, then there was a big crisis 
Uh, there was only one brief moment during the Syriza Anel government that Panos Kamenos, the far right wing minister of defense, implied that the army could guarantee domestic security in Greece. This is the first time since the 1970s that somebody talked about bringing the army into the Turkish, into the Greek political sort of debate or the streets. But of course, this didn't materialize. So in that respect, Greece managed to go through this very difficult moment with success. Thank you so much. Um, I am so sorry to, to announce that we have to be closing. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Yanis Grigoriadis for the, for the, I don't know, for the third or the fourth time. Uh, Yanis, this was wonderful. Um, we've, I learned so much. Thing. You've put so much into a lot of comparative as well as um, historical perspective. And um, I'd like to end here uh, and, and thank everyone also for joining us this on this very morning. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.